everyone, Pushing Up Roses here, and welcome to my holiday episode. Every year I look forward to browsing Christmas movies of dubious quality. Who's going to lose their beloved inn? Who's going to bond over cooking? Will these two people who despise each other have a change of heart over the holidays and find true love? I can't get enough of this saccharine baloney. It's like Christmas crack to me. Usually I prefer these on the melodramatic side, but this year I found something truly amazing. A non-problematic, wholesome, borderline boring flick starring Melissa Joan Hart and Jason Priestley. You are no doubt familiar with the former for her roles in God's Not Dead 2 and Holiday in Handcuffs. The latter you may recognize from his days as a teen heartthrob on Beverly Hills 90210. So what kind of shenanigans are these 90s teen stars going to get into? None. This movie is somehow shenanigan-free, but let's look at it anyway and marvel over how much it resembles a piece of chewed-up cardboard. Okay, time out. Why do these movies have the worst font choices? I can never read them, they're always abrupt and on a very busy screen. Okay, mini tangent, let's continue. Our story focuses on Natalie Morgan, an award-winning podcaster who hosts a show called Holiday Love. Her latest series is Dear Christmas, where she'll talk about Christmas crud and love and crap. She looks extremely well off and there's no way in hell anything can make me believe she makes that much money on a holiday podcast to live in such an amazing place in downtown Chicago. I guess she does work for a company called Earmuffs, owned by this woman named Penny, but still, I don't buy it. Penny helps Natalie wrap some Christmas presents and we get a small exposition dump. Natalie plans to go back home for the holidays to see her parents, who own a bookstore in Lake Tahoe, and her sister, who is nearly nine months pregnant. Penny asks her if she has a romantic sweetheart back home. You've been in love before, right? Yeah, I've been in love a bunch of times. I just... You know, never found my true love. So you don't believe in true love? Whoa, whoa, whoa. How did she extract that from Natalie's statement? She says she hasn't found love. She didn't say she didn't believe in it. Christ. Penny goes on to say that her and her boyfriend broke up. I thought I was in love. Well, maybe you just don't believe in it, Penny. So Natalie sets off from Chicago to Nevada. As she gets close to Lake Tahoe, one of her tires blows out and she has to pull over and call for roadside assistance. She tries to keep her sister informed on the phone. Just call me. Emma? Hello? Ugh. Battery! First of all, why wasn't your phone charging? And second of all, no one just yells battery. Except James Hetfield. Battery! As she is waiting, she begins talking to a glass heart hanging on the door like a very normal person. Funny meeting you here. Any plans for Christmas? Yep, extremely normal vibes right here. Jazz music starts playing, and you know what that means. There's a hottie on the radar. Ho, ho, ho. Yes, I am. Take me now, Jason Priestley. He tells Natalie to wait in his decked the halls out pickup truck where he has hot cocoa and an extra charging cable. What a smooth ladies, man. I tap that. Ugh, never mind. Natalie compliments the hot cocoa, trying to figure out what makes it so gosh darn yummy. Hot pepper flake. Oh, you got it. Don't tell anyone, though. It's my secret ingredient. Oh, how innovative. No one's ever done that before. Before he leaves, he tells her he'll see her tomorrow, which throws Natalie off. See you tomorrow. You sound pretty sure about that. Pretty sure. Get ready to hear those lines a million times. Natalie comes home to a warm, fully decorated house. Where's the inflatable Santa? Where are the candy cane lights? And... Where's our Christmas tree? Oh, I'm sorry, is this not enough for you? Oh, hey, it's this guy. I know he's a pretty well-known actor, but in my heart, he'll always be the Cup of Joe Side of Dough guy from Portlandia. And we got the um, Cup of Joe Side of Dough for 99. She sits and speaks with her family, and my God, is Emma pregnant with a basketball? At dinner, Natalie explains that she'll be doing a live podcast from home about true love, and her parents regale her with a mushy story about how they met. As she's cleaning out her childhood room, her sister finds her first grade diary, which will be a huge part of this story, and after that, Natalie gets an email from one of her viewers. She had asked them to send in testimonials about how they discovered true love. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I know who these people are because I watch trash TV. They were on a reality show called Married at First Sight. If you like trash, check it out. Later that night, Natalie reads some of her first grade diary. Dear first grade, I see you've always been uncreative. The next morning, Natalie wakes up to a loud hammering noise. Sup. Seems like Melissa Joan Hart just can't get away from dudes in her window. Turns out this guy was hired to hang Christmas lights. Her parents give her some coffee and a Christmas donut to bring out to him. Hey, he really is the cup of Joe side of dough guy. Oh, cup of Joe side of dough, I'm so ready. Hunky McStudmuffin introduces himself as Chris Massey and explains they were in eighth grade band together. Chris Massey. Christmassy. 
Really? We don't have a connection. <laughs> Savage. Hey, Roses from the editing room here. And as I was working on this video, I happened to reread the plot synopsis on Amazon and they get Chris's name wrong. As Natalie prepares to embark on a tour for her new book, she stops back home to spend Christmas with her family where she unexpectedly begins to experience her own holiday romance as sparks ignite with firefighter Jack. Who the fuck is Jack? This character's whole thing was that his name sounds like Christmas. How did someone get this wrong? Chris tries to find an extension cord to get the lights working and... Oh! I found it! Oh! That was the most forced fall I have ever seen. Now we're connected. Ugh. Her parents go off to the bookstore for the day while Natalie and Christmassy stay behind and decorate. We get a decorating montage and so far these characters have no chemistry but they're very successful in putting up a giant inflatable Santa. Natalie visits her folks at the newly owned bookstore. Nonfiction here, right? Bestsellers there and staff pick here. And those are all the genres you need. Natalie notices one of those glass hearts on her father's desk saying she's seen them around town. They're everywhere this Christmas. Why? What a weird response because it's a cute decoration, Gail. Wow, this is really heating up. Let's take a quick break and when we come back, we'll see what Christmassy is up to. Natalie wanders over to the cafe next door to drop off a gift basket her parents have been giving out and guess who she runs into? Mr. Christmas himself, Chris Massey. On top of being a tow truck driver, Christmas decorator, and all around handyman, he's also a musician who's playing a sing-along for the local kids. They sit and have a drink together and discover they have a lot of things in common. Like an eerie amount of things. They both spent time in Norway, then Japan at similar times, then they both spent time in Australia, and before he stopped traveling, he was going to be at some celebration at the same time Natalie was. What if this is some weird parasocial plot? What if there is no Christmassy and they never went to school together? He's just like some crazy stalker. Whew. It's like So I Married an Axe Murderer, but more literal. So anyway, Chris lost his brother unexpectedly, so he moved back home to be a better uncle to his niece and nephew. They go on to talk about true love. Finding true love is like finding a unicorn. True love equals unicorn. Non-existent. Got it! Now it's time for some romantic tree murdering. Chris gets an unexpected call from his niece, who's having boyfriend issues, so he puts her on the phone with Natalie. As she's awkwardly talking to this girl she's never met, Chris points up to a tree, which Natalie rejects. He looks so upset! Dude, that tree is 60 feet tall, though. What the fuck is wrong with you? I just love these mugs Priestley is throwing when he's searching for trees. He's so determined! I also love that this is a blatantly fake tree. You can even hear the plastic rustling around as they move it. Oh. Natalie introduces- ooh, ow. I just bashed my finger on my desk. This is hardcore voiceover, people! Natalie introduces Emma to Chris, and she has quite the reaction. Nice to meet you, Mr. Christmas. You gonna bring my sister a present this year? Girl! This scene wouldn't be complete without a callback to an earlier scene. I'll see you tomorrow. You sound pretty sure of that. Pretty sure. Surely no one will get tired of this gag. As he leaves, Emma admires Chris's butt. The world's most wholesome parents come home and they admire the plastic tree. You should have seen Mr. Christmas and his muscles carrying it in here. Wow, does being pregnant make you extra horny? She is parched. Mom hands Natalie a glass heart ornament to hang on the tree. I've been seeing these glass hearts everywhere. Yeah, you already said that, remember? A few scenes ago? Perfect. I mean, not really. <laughs> Later that night, as she's reading her third grade diary, she gets a notification. When she opens her iPad, a video just starts playing from a black screen, because that's how technology works in movies. Time for an ugly sweater party. Guess who's catering this party? Guess. Just guess. You've got to be kidding me. Yes, Chris is also a volunteer fireman who makes a mean chicken wing. Natalie invites him to the party and they make Christmas drinks together. Okay, I kind of love Chris's ugly sweater. It's amazing. Little heavy handed on the unicorn, but still space Santa. What is this drink they're making? There's like limes and candy canes in it and it kind of resembles acid. And they are pouring a lot of drinks. So many that they needed to reuse a clip of cutting limes. <sighs> she is so good at pouring liquid. So we're 45 minutes into this film, more than halfway done at this point, and we have no conflict. We just have Christmassy being absurdly perfect and Natalie talking about her podcast. As they're looking up at a very starless, muddy sky, Chris shows her where Cassiopeia would be and <gasps> he touches her hand. You horny? This is followed by a lot of eye contact. I should probably get back to the party. 
party. Yeah, I should get back to one of my many places of employment. <laughs> okay, no one does this. When two people want to kiss, they usually just do it. But in these rom-coms, someone is always just on the cusp and then they find a reason to leave. Why? Why do they do this? There's not even a conflict holding them back. He touched your hand, girl. Why are you denying Christmassy? This movie is such a- Sorry. Sorry, went on a little tangent there, didn't mean to dump on ya. Let's look at Space Santa again to cool off. Phew. So Natalie gets ready to go back to the party, but I can barely hear what's being said because of this obnoxious triangle. Well, thank you for helping me out tonight and for making this Christmas party a little more fun. Yeah. Natalie, you won the ugly sweater contest! Whoever was on the triangle went hard. I'll see you tomorrow. You sound pretty sure of that. Pretty sure. I look forward to it. Yep, I hate it. Natalie tries to find her 8th grade diary so she can see if she wrote about Chris, but it's mysteriously missing. Meanwhile, instead of just asking Natalie about her interest in Chris, her parents comically plot about trying to figure it out and it starts to get ominous. Ask her. I'm not gonna ask her, you ask her. Why don't we get Emma to ask her? Why are they that interested? Just ask the woman! Natalie and Emma go shopping together as Emma is bummed her husband isn't home yet and she's about to give birth to a giant fishbowl. While passing storefronts, Natalie clocks one of those glass hearts. They go in and people are making them on the spot. Guess who makes them? Guess. Guess. Can I help you? Oh my god. He's so perfect, it's actually insufferable. Can't you just have a few flaws? Maybe a clicking jaw when you eat, continually losing all of your socks, doesn't like cats, just anything. I need drama. What about all your other jobs? I only do those side gigs to support my art. Yeah, I also ride a tow truck to support my art. Chris shows Natalie how to blow glass and we get a romantic montage set to some sentimental music. It's like Ghost but bad. Also, glass blowing is not this easy. They'd be sweating and tired and working really hard. They have to cut to a different scene completely for the actual glass making, and then bam, back to looking all pristine. Amazing. Fun fact, this is called a glory hole. Yes, really. I'll see you tomorrow. You sound pretty sure of that. Pretty sure. Wow, it's been five whole minutes since we've heard them say that. Chris asks Natalie to the fireman's ball and it's all cute and shit. How much money does a glass blower make? You can't put a price on love. You can actually. For example, my love will cost you about $75 a piece. Etsy shop in the description below. <laughs> Chris stands around awkwardly waiting for Natalie. She better get here sooner or I'm gonna eat this salad. Just as she's about to leave, her sister starts getting contractions. Is this it? Is this the conflict? Natalie can't make it and somehow can't reach Chris and he stood up and there's all this chaos. Oh, they communicate. Well, that's nice. Billy shows up just in time to take Emma to the hospital and Natalie rushes to the ball only to find out it had ended. Oh, is this the conflict? Maybe Chris is all upset and feeling sad and rejected and stuff and oh, he waited for her. And now they're dancing all sweetly. Where is the drama? Did Christmas come early this year? <laughs> you tell me, Natalie. Wink. We're about to figure out this film's conclusion, but before that, let's take a quick break. All this excitement is making me pee. <laughs> Natalie pays a visit to the hot shop to see Chris where he is filling last minute orders. Well, I'll see you tomorrow. You seem pretty sure of that. Pretty sure. I hate it. Natalie receives one last video from Penny, who decided to take a chance on love with Hank from HR. Penny basically monologues forever about finding true love, while Hank sits there and says absolutely nothing. Not one word. It is so awkward, I just want to tell him to blink twice if he needs assistance. Then Penny drops this bomb. I learned this Christmas that true love doesn't happen fast. Natalie is shook. Her entire world just came crumbling down. Her boss, who doesn't even listen to her show, said true love takes time. It must be true. And yeah, that's right. Penny doesn't listen to the podcast she hosts. I should really start listening to your podcast. Yeah, you should. <laughs> so Natalie is pretty perturbed. Could it be with 15 minutes left in this film, have we found the conflict? Are Natalie and Chris moving too fast? Natalie seeks comfort from her mom, who tells her that things like love happen at different times for different people, which is probably the most mature stance on true love I've heard in this film thus far. Way better than equating love to a unicorn. And when I say unicorn, I don't mean Tiffany from Berkeley who wants to experiment. Emma and her baby are home now and whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. 
Look at this fake baby. They aren't even trying to hide it. It's just fully in view. Oh my gosh. Holy crap. This is glorious. Well, that was embarrassing. So Natalie is tripping for absolutely no reason, questioning her feelings, and Chris comes up with this brilliant plan. Role play. He's going to pretend to call into her podcast so she can give him advice. It doesn't work and she keeps harping on the fact that true love doesn't happen that fast and that she lives 2,000 miles away anyway. You know, it's easy to fall in love during the holidays. But not true love, right? Right, true love is a unicorn, very good. He then drops this little nugget. And for the record, my crush on you started in the eighth grade. Oh, he's got you there. Natalie is confused and takes out her aggressions on inflatable Santa. She reassures her family with a resounding, I'm fine, let's go make cookies. It's okay, Natalie, chin up. Just look at yourself in the mirror and say, I'm fine. I'm fine. As she is getting ready for her live podcast, her dad comes in and tells her to look in his desk drawer for a surprise. It's her eighth grade diary. Wow. I wonder if this will play a significant role in the story's denouement. Oh, look, audacity. Sort of. So Natalie starts the podcast and goes on her true love spiel, but she kind of loses the plot and starts rambling nonsensically. Is she rambling? She is so rambling. Emma texts her with hoo-ha-ha, -ha, and on the air, Natalie starts doing Lamaze breathing. Emma tells her to tell your story about you and Chris. And I'm dedicating this podcast to the one I love. The one I regrettably pushed away. She announces her love for Christmassy over the live stream and he is pretty stoked. And look at that, she wrote about him in her eighth grade diary, meaning it was meant to be. Wait, wait, another time out. You didn't remember the name Chris Massey? I remember my third grade crush's name and it was fairly common, but you forgot about someone named Chris Massey. I, I don't buy it. Later that night, there's a tapping on the door. It's Santa. Hi. Hi. Want to see what's in my sack? It's red and fuzzy. Yeah, so they confess their endless love. Chris gives her a glass unicorn with a ring on it. Not an engagement ring, but a ring that symbolizes his affection. Wow, what a roller coaster of precisely one emotion with the same consistent low energy throughout the ride. I think I must be conditioned for extremely dramatic, high conflict holiday movies that I get infuriated with because the characters don't communicate because this movie was the polar opposite and I was left feeling a little bored. This is like the quintessential romantic fantasy, finding a perfect, multi-talented, good looking partner over the holidays, communicating like adults, then having a happy ending. I respect it for not succumbing to the common tropes you see in this kind of film, the tropes I would probably be complaining about if this was one of those films, but at the same time, it's so saccharine, my teeth are rotting. Now, upon second viewing, I found I did enjoy it a little more for its wholesome tone, and unlike a lot of low-budget trash you see around Christmas, this felt a little more quality. Notably, the acting was good, the background music was not obnoxious, with the exception of that triangle, and the dad character played by Ed Begley Jr. was so wholesome, it made me miss my own dad. Everyone is just so aggravating warm and it does not compute. I did have a fantastic time riffing on this film, so that's a plus. And if you're looking for something so benign it's absurd, Dear Christmas is for you. If you want a lot of drama and conflict that makes your blood boil, then go watch The Princess Switch or something. Or watch both, why not? It's the holidays, life is short, watch what you want. I hope you all have a fantastic holiday, and if you don't celebrate, I hope you have a fantastic day. See you next year. Hey everyone, thanks for watching my video on Dear Christmas. I hope it gave you the holiday fuzzies and a few chuckles. If you want to see more content from me, I have more to show you. But first I want to give a hearty shout out to my patrons who continue to support my channel even when I cover junk like this. If you want to donate a few bucks to my cat's treat fund, please consider joining my Patreon campaign. And if not, leaving a comment is just about the best thing you can do to drive engagement. If you want to see more from me, here are a few recommendations. On the right, I have the last video I did, a breakdown of Stephen King's cocaine-fueled masterpiece, Maximum Overdrive, and on the left I have a hilarious video about murder she wrote. Thanks again, happy holidays, and as always, I will see you in the next one.